Hello and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests. My name is Mae Colcord and I am a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, and service. We acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect for the rights and wisdom of indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial histories and commit to decolonizing our own practices, to learning new ways of being in community, in good relationship with the indigenous people of this land and with the land itself. Today's service is sadly the last that will be led by our wonderful interim minister, Dr. Reverend Teresa Cooley. With <laughs> With music by our music director, Dr. Zaneda Robles, Wells Lang, Ro Rowan, and our music staff. Please. <laughs> Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. Families with young children are welcome in the, sanctu in the sanctuary or the narthex. The family service is on hiatus for the summer and will return in the fall. Today, please join us after service for a celebration brunch for Reverend Teresa, as today is her last day with us. Uh, the Building Bridges Task Force welcomes you to join the 2023 Interfaith Dinner and Conversation on July 9th at 5 p.m. Please RSVP to buildingbridges at uuneighborhood.org by July 5th. I've gone the last two, three years, and it's awesome, and everyone who can should go. Um, our order of service and many more announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email, posted in the narthex, or through the QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and many other activities at the welcome table. Again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service. Today's prelude and postlude selections are text scores, that is poetry and prose meant to be prompts of inspiration for the performer. The following performance will involve four iterations. Sonic Meditation 28, Recognition. The text is, listen to a sound until you no longer recognize it.
Good morning. Good morning. Such a lovely crowd here this morning. Why don't we rise as you're willing and able and say good morning to each other. never going to get you back. I know it's so great to see so many old friends. All right. Very lovely to see you all. Our invocation comes from the poet Rumi. This being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. They may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Come, let us worship. Our opening hymn is number 1000, the first hymn in your teal hymnal. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing number 1000, Morning Has Come.
Sorry, guys. Okay. Giving is a spiritual practice through which we put our values into action. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of its contributions to a local social justice organization or activity. In addition to the plate, online giving is available using the QR code on the donations box just outside the sanctuary or using the text instructions shown on the screen. If you wish to make a payment towards your pledge or contribute to church operations, make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the donation box. This week, our gift goes to inner city outings. Here to tell us more is Elizabeth Neat. Elizabeth is a retired teacher. She has been volunteering with ICO for nearly 30 years, leading day hikes, car camps, and service trips. Elizabeth? Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I start, before, not I, but before we start with a short video, I just wanted to tell you that the teacher, the high school teacher in the video, Aphrodita Fuentes, has said that without the interaction with ICO, she would have quit teaching. She credits working with the organization's volunteers and the experience that ICO offered her students as giving her the connection and the motivation to stick with teaching. And now I'm gonna, most of what I have to say is in this video. Thank you. This is Malibu Lagoon, and uh, it's kind of an ongoing restoration project to get this back to its natural habitat. And that just takes a lot of love and care. And so that's what this service uh, trip is about. We are going to take out the biscuit grass. This one is the invasive one. This is the one that we need to get out. I'm Ms. Fuentes. I'm a biology teacher at Southgate High School. Today, I brought my students to Malibu Lagoon. Most of my students are ninth graders, and they're very excited to be here. They have a lot of energy. Yeah! Oh, these kids are awesome. They're, they jumped right in. We're ICO, Inspiring Connections Outdoors, but oh, these kids don't need sorry. much inspiring. You know, they're ready to be out here and weeding and get dirty. So we're just helping to make that happen for them. Boys and girls, what are we seeing in here? Tadpoles. What, what are tadpoles? Baby frogs. I'm a classroom teacher, so we are always in a four square wall room, but now, you know, it's limitless right now. They want to connect and they're very hands on, so they're going to touch, you know, and we want that because they make a connection to, you know, our planet. You know, they want to take care of their environment later on and say, let's keep it the way it is for others to enjoy. What I try to do is once we're done with a, a field trip is we write about it, we draw about it, make that outdoor connections indoor. Inspiring connections outdoors. Hey, what could be better when all the kids are learning in the great outdoors here? Mm. <laughs> the most fun thing about this is like, you see like little kids you've never seen before and like you never knew that existed. The lagoon is really beautiful. The water is beautiful. There's a lot of birds and plants. ICO, Inspiring Connections Outdoors. It's so important to me as a teacher because no other organization gives me four buses for four different trips during the year. We definitely need more support. Our mission is to raise money to pay for the buses so that they have the transportation out into nature. 99% of our donations go to our transportation, which is a very hard thing to get. These youngsters are going to be the stewards of our environment. It's a small investment for hopefully a bigger return. So as the, as the video highlighted, we are a volunteer organization. We have no paid staff in LA. 
um, about 95% of our funding of the money we raise goes toward providing bus transportation to get the kids outside. Uh, before the pandemic, we led well over 100 trips a year. In 2022, ICO had 98 outings, making our recovery <laughs> with 2,241 students and 551 associated adults participating. I know each volunteer hike leader has favorite memories. One of mine is when a young girl rounded a turn in the trail, you know, climbing up the mountain, you kind of go around a turn and then the vista opens up before you. And when that happened for her, she said, teacher, teacher, come quick. You can see the whole world from here. <laughs> and that memory still gives me goosebumps. So thank you very much for your, for your support. Thank you. Would the volunteers please come forward? We thank you in advance for giving generously. Imani means faith. It's the seventh principle of Kwanzaa. Please join me in the spirit of prayer, meditation, reflection. Let us ground our bodies and open our spirits. As I share this prayer from the Reverend Laura Martin. Praise the unfinished sentence, the bread before it rises. Praise the roots and the branches the tangled life under your feet or beyond your reach. Praise the northernmost star. Praise the fold in the map. Praise the cup when it is given to you full and when it is set down empty. Praise the longings you whisper and the candles you blow out. Praise the tables where you used to sit the sand where you napped in the afternoon, the donkey you fed from your hand, the trees you saw as your plane descended. Praise the paths that lead up mountains you will not hike. Praise the stages that are bare and silent. Praise this living, yes, this living. Praise this place where you cannot step too far ahead Praise what is beyond your responsibility and praise what you can create. Praise the raw truth of grief and the shape of unknowing. Praise where you stand in this day, the particularity of you. Praise. Amen.
Now I've heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. But you don't really care for music, do you? Well, it goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the baffled king composing, alleluia, 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 Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. Her beauty and the moonlight overthrew you. She tied you to the kitchen chair. She broke your throne. She cut your hair. And from your lips, she drew. Maybe I've been here before. I know this room. I've walked this floor. I used to live alone before I knew you. And I've seen your flag on the marble arch. But love is not a victory march. It's a cold and it's a bright. Maybe there's a God above, and all I ever learned from love was how to shoot at someone who outdrew you. It's not a cry that you hear at night, it's not someone who's seen the light, it's a call. <laughs> That's cruel and unusual. <laughs> Wasn't that unbelievably... Good morning. 
So we three are here to represent the church leadership of the last three years, which includes many of you as board members and in other group leadership positions and responsibilities. We want to briefly recap the journey we've been on together through this interim period and acknowledge the guide that we've had on that journey. In psychology, there's a term, the good enough mother. Um, I had a wonderful mother, but she was not good enough in this sense. It was coined to describe the caregiver who helps a child to identify and manage their own feelings, not ignore or disappear them, and to develop along their own path, not as a reflection or appendage of the parent. Like a good enough mother, a good leader, whether permanent or interim, does that for a community, and does it not from the mountaintop, but alongside. We have been fortunate to have that kind of leadership in our interim minister for these three years. We are a strong church with a long and vibrant history. Like any individual, family, or community, we have experienced ups and downs, conflict and change, growth and loss, and not always fully understood at the time. When Reverend Teresa came to us, we had just experienced a difficult ministerial parting, resulting in a wide range of feelings and questions. We were also just beginning to deal with the isolation, fear, and uncertainties of COVID. Teresa understood our need to heal and our commitment to build new models of relationship and leadership. She brought us tremendous experience and expertise for this work, along with a spirit of partnership, experimentation, and connection over perfection. I am deeply grateful for the chance to learn and lead together with you. With her help, we have been able to process our individual experiences of loss, grief, anger, and disappointment which left unacknowledged would have inhibited our ability to heal and grow in this community. We have been able to deepen our commitment to justice and diversity as a spiritual practice. We have been able to reaffirm and grow our understanding of community. We have been able to forge new models of participation in decision-making and leadership accountability and Reverend Teresa has helped us to broaden our focus and embrace change, to weather storms, to tr accept and transform with conflict, and to envision our future as we come together in community. We together are Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church. So now, even as we joyfully welcome a new called minister, we will also have to practice our skills at acknowledging and processing grief and loss at Teresa's departure. But like Mary Poppins, <laughs> as she takes flight to her next assignment, she will leave us a happier, and more fa functional family in her wake. <laughs> Good 
Good morning. I, there were supposed to be two of us today. I'm Farrell Menon, and Frank Colcord was supposed to be with me as leaders of the transition team. But as I was walking out the door, I got a text from Frank saying, hey, help, will you read my part? I'm sick and I can't make it. I thought I could, but I can't. So he's homesick, so this, this message is on, in behalf of both of us. So I'm gonna begin by reading Frank's part. From the very start, when Farrell and I were first asked to join the interim minister search committee, and Reverend Teresa was on the list of candidates we received, we knew we were fortunate. Out of the seven candidates on that list, Reverend Teresa immediately bubbled to the top. Her depth of experience as a parish and interim minister, let alone her significant leadership roles with the UUA, made her a pretty easy pick. And I agree, she was an easy pick. As a bonus, she came with a lifelong connection to our beloved Minister Emeritus, Brandy Lovely. As Farrell and I went on to co-chair the transition team with Reverend Teresa, one of the things I most appreciated about working with Teresa was her understanding of and personal connections to an amazing array of UUA resources. It was like when she arrived, she brought the whole UU Cavalry, Cav Cav Cavalry, you know what I mean, with her. From the UUA, tra UUA transition teams to the Pacific West regional staff to UUA consultants from across the country, and of course the wonderful host of preacher friends she called on to supplement her presence in our pulpit. All of this is much more than we would have had such ready access, access to with anyone else. That said, I would like to thank Teresa and Farrell for helping the transition team in its efforts and in, in its becoming a model for our new ministerial advisory committee the board will soon convene, but mostly for the three years of deeply meaningful collaborative work together and for all this brought to our beloved community. Um, and I, I just wanna say that one of the real pleasures of all this work was the chance to work side by side with Frank over the three years. That, it, it, it's, it's been terrific, I really like it. Uh, and he's an extremely responsible person and I know he would have done anything he could to be here if it was possible. We started our transition work almost immediately after Teresa got here. And even though we had to meet by Zoom, we immediately developed a very strong connection with her. We came to appreciate her organization and her understanding of the kinds of activities we need to do to do the work of changing ministry. We had to address the hurts of the past, begin to vision for the future, and be ready to call a new minister. We organized lots of events at her direction to help get us to that process. Her depth of knowledge, her ability to acknowledge our strengths as a congregation, but also to point out the problems we needed to address was amazing. All of this she did with graciousness and love. And during a pandemic, we came away with great admiration of her skills, her vast knowledge of the transition process, as well as her ability to minister to us individually. It is hard to imagine a leader who could have better prepared us for our future. We thank her for all she has done and are grateful have, to have worked with her for the past three years and want to share with her our great affection and gratitude. We are a different church than when she got here and I think a better one. And we are ready for our next step, a called minister. Thank you, Teresa. <laughs> Thank you all. I don't know what idiot decided that I had to follow all of that. <laughs> I think it was me. <laughs> and could I ask anybody who served on the board for the last three years to rise so that we can recognize and thank you. Thank you. 
and those of you who served on the transition team as well. When I left my very first called position in Detroit, Michigan, the UUA sent me a book, and it was called Running Through the Thistles. <laughs> by Rory Oswald. It was all about how to end a ministry well. And one message from it stood out for me so much that I still remember it 30 years later. The way in which you end your ministry is the way in which you will die. <laughs> Rather dire, isn't it? <laughs> I went back and found the book on Google Books to make sure I remembered it correctly, and here is the larger quote. The manner and style in which we close out that ministry will be very similar to the way in which we will die. As we observe ourselves in the context of a ministerial closure, we must ask ourselves, is this the manner in which I want to die? In death and in grief, we do not so much need protection from painful experience as we need the boldness to face it. If we choose love, we must also choose the courage to grieve. I think the reason it is stuck in my memory all these years later is that I don't always do endings well. I'm not sure what that says about my death, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully I've learned. I have often been one of those to pace, to race pell-mell through those thorny thistles of grief, to borrow that metaphor from Oswald, thinking that I won't maybe get stuck by grief along the way. And of course, that doesn't work very well. My grief at leaving this ministry is real. See, I'm taking his advice. <laughs> <laughs> I have loved working with you all and feel, as I've said before, that I have learned some valuable lessons Last week, I was attending General Assembly, the annual gathering of UUs mostly from the US, but also from around the world. And going to GA as a minister who has served for 34 years means I necessarily end up subconsciously or consciously reviewing my career. I see people from every church I've served or consulted with, often in the very same room, sometimes in the very same elevator. <laughs> and as someone who's very contextually driven, this can be kind of an overwhelming experience. It feels like I was a different person in each setting. And it also reminds me that I have not always been so successful. Every church that I served as a called minister pretty much fell apart after I left. Now, I'm not so egotistical as to believe that this was because they couldn't thrive without me. <laughs> Nor am I necessarily that hard on myself. I know I did some good ministry in these places. But to have such a pattern exist means I have to look more deeply. And another pattern is emerging. The churches that I've served as an interim thrive after I've left. So what is going on here? <laughs> Clearly some good advice about career path is one. <laughs> I went back and looked at the sermon that I preached in my previous interim in Arlington, Virginia, my very last sermon with them, and I found a clue. In Arlington, as here, they were recovering from a minister who sexually abused congregants, who bullied staff, manipulated vulnerable people. He was incredibly charismatic. And so he left people wondering how they could have been so fooled by him. 
and wondering what it said about the church that had called him. From the beginning of my time there, the mantra became, we are the church. And by that they meant that they were determined not to be defined by whomever their minister is. That they could, and indeed did, find a minister who complemented their abilities, not one who led them down a garden path. They grew in their own strength and their own wisdom and worked on their relationships with one another. It was a better church when I left. And now they have a wonderful minister doing great work with them. I know it wasn't just them, I know I helped, but I helped them mostly by continually giving the work back to them. And that experience helped prepare me for the work that I did with you, a congregation also recovering from a bullying minister. I kept asking you over and over again to do your own work, and you did. I believed in you from the beginning because there were so many signs of health already here, and you responded by doing your work, not always perfectly, but always earnestly. And here's the other clue for me about my ministry. None of this happened because I worked 80 hours a week, like I used to, or even 50. I have been more balanced and clear about protecting my time in this interim work than I have ever managed to do before. And I could do this because I realized that the work was not all mine to do. And I was actually doing you no favor by taking the work on myself. So as we've already acknowledged, you took on some very big challenges during these last three years, and you didn't give up. You kept on showing up, even when it was hard. You, kept, you opened yourself up to seeing the flaws in your history and your culture, and have vowed to keep examining them and changing. You worked on your relationships with one another, healing past hurts, and trying to learn how to do better. Because here's the thing, when people do something because I tell you to do it, that's a thrill that only goes so far. Because ultimately, you can choose to follow somebody else next. It is far, far more satisfying to give people the space and the tools and the encouragement to decide to do what is best for them. To see people living into their own power is among the most gratifying gifts ministry can bring. Now, it wouldn't be a Teresa sermon if I didn't quote Adrienne Marie Brown. <laughs> she said, nothing is required of me more than being and creating. Simultaneously being present with who I am who we are as a species, and creating who we must become. And within the who, I must become. What you pay attention to grows, grow this revolution. And it is indeed revolutionary to buck our cultural trend of following the leader and instead engage in the radical work of learning and growing together. So here is my last piece of advice for you. Keep learning. Keep opening yourself up to new ways of thinking about religious life. Keep figuring out your own place in the system and identifying how you might need to grow. If you're white identified, keep examining your privilege and face your inevitable mistakes. And for everyone, keep showing up and pitching in, doing your part to make this the thriving community I know you can be. My deepest prayer and wish for you is that you will continue to have the courage to live into this kind of communal leadership. To not relax by thinking, oh, now we have a new minister that can do things for us. But to ask yourself what you can do to contribute to the revolution. 
not a political revolution, but a revolution of mind and body and spirit in which we can be galvanized into living our UU principles in a new and deeper way. You will always be in my heart. I will keep trying to learn from the lessons you've taught me. I know you are a blessing to this community and to one another. Thank you for who you are and who you are still learning to become. Thank you. in your gray hymn or on the screens above. Please rise in body or in spirit and join in singing number 108, My Life Flows On in Endless Song. Our benediction comes from the poet Ann Hillman. We look with uncertainty beyond the old choices for clear-cut answers to a softer, more permeable aliveness, which is every moment at the brink of death. For something new is being born in us if we but let it. We stand at a new doorway, awaiting that which comes next daring to be human creatures, vulnerable to the beauty of existence, learning 
to love. Hallelujah and amen. <laughs>